Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, welcome to SJP's International Solidarity with Palestine, for the Global Intifada. The theme of tonight's event is Building Global Solidarity. In that light, UCLA professor Lucy Burns was unable to join us tonight, but asked us to read the following statement of solidarity from the Critical Filipino Studies Collective. Thank you to the organizers of this event, especially the students who have created this space for us together. Thank you and welcome to our distinguished guest, Omar Barhuti, and thank you to our distinguished co-panelists, Robin Kelly, for offering their time, words, and inspiration so that we may gather in support of Palestinian freedom and in support of each other. This statement by the Critical Filipino Filipino Studies Collective, CSFSC, expresses shared academic principles and academic interests in support of the self-determination of marginalized Filipinos Filipinas throughout the global diaspora, as well as other subjugated peoples throughout the world. CFFSC stands with international acts of solidarity for Palestinian people with basic human rights. As Filipino and Filipino American academics, activists, organizers, and allies, the CFFSC stands with all people resisting colonial domination, violent occupation, and dehumanizing racism. While the histories of the Philippines and Palestine are in no way equivalent, Filipino people have also experienced the denial of sovereignty and self-determination as exemplified throughout history, and in particular to Philippines' neo-colonial relationship with the United States. We applaud public articulations and practices of anti-empire politics in the 21st century. While the CFFSC is focused and committed to the confrontation of empire building grounded in the Philippines' colonial history and neo-colonial present, we find inspiration, hope, and points of commonality with other oppressed peoples, resistance to injustice and oppression, and in particular, and in particular the resistant imagination and everyday practices of Palestinian people to insist on their freedom. Support of Palestinian freedom is global justice, pro-democratic, and a pro-peace position taken against state violence in Palestine. We join Palestinians in imagining a global society united against historic and ongoing occupations and dehumanizing regimes. Uh, so that was the letter from the Critical Filipino and Filipino Studies Collective. And Professor Burns has also graciously given us a few words from which uh, to introduce our speakers. She writes, Omar Barhuti writes, cultural expression expands the free zone in our collective mind, where progressive transformation can thrive. In response to all the attempts to circumscribe our aspirations, we must push on, dreaming and being creative boundlessly. Robin Kelly, in his book Freedom Dreams, writes, Progressive social movements enable participants to imagine something different, to realize that things need not always be this way. It is that imagination, that effort to see the future in the present, that I shall call poetry or poetic knowledge. I am most excited about speakers for the evening because of their points of entry to freedom is through artistic and cultural resistance. Their, their strong stance about the role of art in any human struggle, the emancipatory possibilities of artistic practice inspires me. Their approach to art by oppressed peoples reminds us that art connected to social movements are complex in their aesthetic value. Imaginative labors of art and social movements lay the groundwork for new and radical worlds to come. So, I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers now. Our first speaker tonight is Robin Kelly. Dr. Kelly is the Gary D. Nash Professor of American History here at UCLA, and has spent much of his career exploring American and African American history, with a particular emphasis on radical social movements and the political dynamics at work within African American culture, including jazz, hip hop, and visual arts. He is the author of Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination. He is also on the advisory board of the US Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. Our second speaker for the evening is Omar Barhudi, an independent Palestinian commentator and human rights activist. He's a founding member of the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel and the BDS movement Boycott, Divest, and Sanctions. He is also the author of Boycott, Divest, and Sanctions, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights. Last, Student for Justice in Palestine at UCLA would like to thank the law school for making space available for this event, and for members of the law school who have made time to be present at this event as well. If you are not already on our mailing list, please find the sign-up sheet so that we can keep you up to date about our organizing work and future events. On that side note, um, uh, the speakers have requested that no video recording be going on tonight, uh, so you can please respect that. Um, so, we have a collective responsibility to one another, to the speakers, and to the principles of academic freedom of the university to listen and participate respectfully in the exchange of ideas presented at this forum. And towards that end, the organizers should develop ground rules which we are certain everyone can respect. 
First, clearly attempts to interrupt the speaker or repeated outbursts during his or her remarks or loud and disruptive behavior preventing the speaker from being heard is not acceptable. During Q&A, please present your question or comment in just a few sentences. Questions from the floor will be taken after the formal presentations. Intentionally obstructing the view of the speakers or the audience will not be permitted. Distribution of literature should not play, take place during the program. Please do not insist in enforcing these rules unless you have been assigned to do so by the organizers. Please note that if you cannot abide by these ground rules, you may be asked to leave the room and appropriate authorities will be contacted. And with that, I'd like to welcome Robin Kelly. I'm going to be brief because I'm here to hear a whole more more <laughs> Um, I just have a few things to say. By the way, um, that crazy fire that's circulating, I was just, it kind of cracked me up. Um, the one that has quotes from King and Mandela. And by the way, the Mandela quote is, is actually this kind of cut up, chopped up thing. What Mandela actually said was that we recognize the legitimacy of Palestinian nationalism just as we recognize the legitimacy of Zionism as Jewish nationalism. That's what he said. So to, the way it's framed is like, oh, we recognize Zionism. If you actually read Mandela, he was very critical of Zionism. Um, he, when he became president of South Africa, he definitely had um, a very interesting relationship with Israel um, as a head of state. But the fact of the matter is that he, you know, if you don't believe me, you can read an article that I co-wrote with Eric, Erica Lorraine Williams and Power Punch a few weeks ago called uh, Madiba in Palestine, which kind of lays out that, uh, that history. But we could talk about that. Um, anyway, I'm really honored here to be with uh, Omar Barghouti, uh, whose book, BDS, uh, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights, I read before I visited the West Bank two years ago. And the book was transformative, just like my, my experience there. Um, it's also a great honor to speak on the 85th birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King today, January 15th. Despite the fact we celebrated on Monday, um, and by the way, the representation of Dr. King um, as you know, like a great defender of Israel, is complicated because you've got to put everything in historical perspective. Um, Dr. King died in 1968. 1967 was a turning point for him, and he really struggled with the question of the Israeli occupation. Before that, you know, again, we can talk about that history, um, but the way that these figures from my hero were being you know, appropriated by various organizations to support right-wing causes, um, I, I find very problematic. But Dr. King is bare witness. Um, you know, we'll, we'll find out. Anyway, so finally, it's also important to be here just a month after the passing of, of Nelson Mandela, whose death reminded <coughs> us again of the long struggle against apartheid uh, and also made a lot of folks, some of my colleagues, really nostalgic about those days of the anti-apartheid movement, um, recalling their roles in, um, in the movement and the way that Mandela was a very inspiring uh, presence. Um, it's also interesting because many of my uh, so-called progressive left friends who are very strong against the academic and cultural boycott, very strong against divestment campaigns, saying, you know, why single out Israel? Um, they were supportive of anti-apartheid divestment movements and boycott then. So I'm like, well, what changed? What's different? And no one's given me a, a legitimate answer yet, so I'm waiting for that. Um, from the Linda Gordons and Alice Kessler Harris, there's, I, there's a long list you can, you can mention. Um, the death of Mandela has also generated a wave of historical revision and myth-making uh, where the media really eulogized uh, Mandela not for his commitment to the ANC, uh, to the struggle, the unrelenting struggle against apartheid, but rather for forgiving his oppressors. That's what he's remembered for. Um, in other words, Mandela was great because he transcended race. He chose not to hate. Now, of course, hate, if you know anything about the ANC, has nothing to do with the ANC. I mean, the politics of the ANC was a struggle going back really to 1909, if you want to be specific, uh, for non-racial organization uh, committed to democracy for all. And in this way, the mass media transformed what was a, pot a potent international BDS movement into a slogan, Free Nelson Mandela. Free Nelson Mandela was the slogan on top of the BDS movement. The BDS movement gets wiped out of the history, and we get 
this whole struggle to free Nelson Mandela, when actually it was about dismantling apartheid. That's what that struggle was about. And yet again, um, a broad social movement to overthrow a racist, oppressive regime becomes individualized into being about an exceptional figure, and that's dangerous. As many of us who you know, worked toward building the BDS movement and support the academic and cultural boycott to end the occupation, to guarantee the right of Palestinians to return, and to dismantle the system of apartheid in Israel, including the separation wall, uh, Mandela continues to be an inspiration. Uh, he and his comrades recognize BDS as a turning point in the anti-apartheid struggle. And in fact, the South Africa case may be the best example we have today of how a principled international boycott and divestment campaign can actually help change the conditions on the ground. Um, Archbishop uh, 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 Devin Tutu drew inspiration from Mandela's warning against reading, quote, reconciliation and fairness as meaning parity between justice and injustice, and in defending his own support for BDS. Uh, in fact, it was uh, Bishop Tutu who said, you know, uh, it can never be business as usual. Israeli universities are an intimate part of the Israeli regime by act of choice. Palestinians have chosen, like we did, the nonviolent tools of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, after attending the Russell Tribunal in Palestine, Mandela's longtime friend and colleague, who also was in Robin Island with them, um, Ahmed Kamarda, who, if you've seen the film, um, he is the, the one non, he's the one uh, South Asian uh, figure in, in the film. But Kadarda wrote, you know, I'm deeply convinced that the Palestinians are experiencing life akin to, and in many respects far worse than, what we had under apartheid in South Africa. And he goes on to say, some would have us believe that the South African story is only uh, one of dialogue and reconciliation. It was indeed about these. However, it was also about the struggle against occupation and one for justice. So I want to kind of you know, close by saying a few words specifically about the campaign here 30 years ago uh, to get the UC system to divest in South Africa. Because I think there's important lessons for all of us. I mean, I was here 30 years ago. I know. I look like a, I look kind of young. My wife says I do. Uh, but I was, I was a graduate student here. I was actually here from um, 83 to 87 at the height of the anti-apartheid movement. Um, I was also... Um, very active in that I was president of the African Activist Association uh, for one year um, from 83 to, no, 84 to 85. And then also, um, we were editing a journal called Upahamu, and, and I had a, we had a special issue on the, the movement that keeps South Africa out of the Olympics. Because remember, in 84, some of you weren't even born then. Um, <laughs> but in 84, uh, the, the, the Olympics came to, to Los Angeles, and we had organized a campaign against it, uh, supporting an existing campaign, which goes way, way back. In any case, um, the main action on campus, though, in that period was the struggle to get the UC system to divest. And you know, you can go back and do research on this. It took shanty towns. It took many arrests here at UCLA, at Berkeley. In fact, there was a strong um, divestment movement at Cal State Long Beach, where I did my undergraduate work. You know, back in the early 80s, like I was from 80 to 83, and we had struggles going on there as well. Altogether, over 200 people were arrested. Hundreds of police came on campus, from off campus, and, and on campus people were involved. Um, the struggle to, di to divest uh, predated my coming to campus. In fact, and this is an important lesson here, it begins in earnest around 1977 uh, with a group called South Africa Catalyst Project. And of course, they're inspired by Soweto. And this struggle was finally victorious in nine years. So in July 1986, UC regents voted to divest $3.1 billion invested in South Africa and Namibia. By the way, so those of you who don't know, South Namibia was essentially a colony of South Africa that was sort of a mandate that South Africa ran. That was another struggle that was involved. So, um, and the idea was that the UC uh, regents voted to withdraw over three years. So one third of the money would be um, divested over a three year period from US firms and banks that do business in South Africa. Um, now, I mention this because there's a very weak argument 
that circulates against BDS, uh, and that is that BDS, uh, in terms of Israel, will alienate those good liberal forces in Israel, will make Israelis feel even more embattled, close off the possibility of negotiating settlements. So therefore, we can't support BDS. But this is flawed logic, because for one thing, as Rashid Khalidi shows, this U.S. brokered peace deal business is a dead end. It was always a dead end. You know, um, that's not the same. <coughs> and it assumes that you know the idea that the U.S. brokered peace deal assumes that the issue, the question, is one of conflict resolution, not colonial domination, not violation of law and human rights. Um, and the other thing is that the experience of South Africa proves how fallacious this argument is, because you have to acknowledge that the anti-apartheid movement, in, you know, and BDS directed at South Africa, along with the labor, labor struggles and civil society struggles within South Africa, um, forced the regime to reform. It wasn't, it wasn't kindness. It wasn't saying, you know, we're going to give you a break. No, it was the pressure that forced the regime to reform. So in 1983-84, they, they wrote a new constitution. BDS ramped up after the new constitution. So it was after. It was after reforms were implemented, where they started to extend the vote, at least to colored and Indian people, and talked about extending the vote to Africans, that BDS ramped up. And that's what led to the toppling of, of, of apartheid. It's, you know, it's not, pressure does not get people not to negotiate. Pressure gets people to negotiate or topple a system that's unjust. That's just basic, like physics. You know? <laughs> <laughs> in any case, um, and keep in mind that UDF, United Democratic Front, was formed in 84, I mean, 83, 84, in this period of time of the reforms. 84, 40 US companies pulled out of South Africa. Uh, 1985, 50 pulled out of South Africa. Uh, Citibank declared that it would make no new loans to South Africa in 85. Chase Manhattan the following year. They refused to roll over its short-term loans. <coughs> Barclays announced in March of 1986 that it would lend no new funds to the South African government until it could demonstrate its ability to pay its current debts and eliminate apartheid. And then finally, after Barclays, after Citibank, after Chase, you see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of want to late frame, but it's OK. That's OK. Um, so this is the context for UC's divestment uh, campaign. And again, the movement escalated uh, in 84, uh, and a lot of the reforms uh, were followed by a state of emergency in 86. Um, so it's interesting, too, when you look at California politics, because the tide turned really radically. And this is an important lesson, because sometimes when, when folks, like when many of us were involved with Fahamu in 83, we can imagine that in three years, you see would vote for that. In fact, 85 was hard to imagine that. Um, and this is very, very important. We thought it was going to be a much, much longer struggle. But uh, 86, that was the year, if I remember correctly, Republican government, uh, Governor um, uh, George Duke, Duke Majin was basically trying to run for, he was running for re-election. And he had vetoed earlier state legislature's divestment plan. And then, for his re-election campaign, he had to actually support it, because there's no way he could have, he could have uh, challenged Tom Bradley, who was actually supporting the divestment. So in the end, you know, what killed apartheid was not forgiveness, not apologetics, not compromise, but principles, struggle, and solidarity, right? International solidarity. And this is the key lesson of the South African struggle. A struggle, by the way, that still continues, but that left a powerful legacy of principal movement driven by a vision of democracy free of domination uh, or exclusion. And to help bring this vision into being is to me, to help bring this vision into being um, in Israel, Palestine, is the best way to commemorate Mandela's life, the best way to commemorate Dr. King's life and legacy, um, as well as the hundreds of activists who turned this campus into a battleground for justice here and 10,000 miles away. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I had a previous event uh, at 3.30 PM where I asked permission from uh, Native American 
nations uh, to speak on their traditional ter territory, and they've granted me that. That's why I won't repeat that. Uh, <coughs> I'll speak about Palestine's South Africa moment, relative justice, not relative humans. Theodore Roosevelt once said, quote, a conquest may be fraught with evil or with good for mankind according to the comparative worth of the conquering and conquered peoples, end of quote. This is what I will define later as relative humanization, viewing some people as relative humans, not humans in the full sense of the word. I'll give three examples of Israeli relative humanization of Palestinians, three cases, and then explain the term and move to why BDS. The first case, Israel's apartheid wall. When it is accomplished, Israel's illegal wall in the occupied Palestinian territory will sever up to a quarter of a million Palestinians, mainly farmers, from their lands, which happen to be the West Bank's most fertile agricultural areas, and which sit on top of the Palestinians' largest water aquifers. Despite the wall's grave repercussions on Palestinian livelihood, environment, and political rights, and academic freedom too, a near total consensus exists among Jewish Israelis in support of the wall, under the pretense of security. Some, however, in the Israeli establishment voice peculiar concerns about the wall. In 2003, then Israeli environmental minister Yudit Naot protested the wall, saying, quote, the separation fence severs the continuity of open areas and is harmful to the landscape, the flora and fauna, the ecological corridors and the drainage of the creeks, end of quote. Her ministry and the Israel Nature and National Parks Protection Authority <laughs> mounted diligent rescue efforts to save an affected reserve of irises, flowers, by moving it to an alternative reserve. They also created passages for small animals, foxes and rabbits and so on, and enabled the continuation of the water to flow in the creeks. Still, the spokesperson for the parks, Israeli Parks Authority complained, quote, the animals don't know that there is now a border. They are used to a certain living space, and what we are concerned about is that their genetic diversity will be affected because different population groups of animals will not be able to mate and reproduce. <coughs> Isolating the populations of animals on two sides of a fence definitely creates a genetic problem, end of quote. <coughs> the second case, birth and death at an Israeli military checkpoint. This was widely reported in the Israeli media. Rula, a Palestinian woman, was in the last stages of labor. Her husband, Dawood, could not convince the Israeli soldiers at a typical military checkpoint to let them through to meet the ambulance that was held up on the other side. After a long wait, Rula could no longer hold it. She, she started screaming in pain to the total apathy of the soldiers. <coughs> Dawood describes what happened as follows, quote, Next to the barbed wire, there was a rock. My wife started to crawl toward the rock, and she lay down on it, and I'm still talking with the soldiers. Only one of them paid any attention. The rest didn't even look. She tried to hide behind the rock. She didn't feel comfortable having them see her in her condition. She started to yell and yell. It didn't move them. Suddenly, she shouted, I gave birth, Dawood. I gave birth. I, Dawood says, I started repeating what she said so the soldiers would hear. I said it in Hebrew, in Arabic, they heard. End of quote. Rula later shouted, the girl died, the girl died. Dawood, distraught and fearing for his wife's own life, was forced to cut the umbilical cord with a rock. Commenting on a similar death of another Palestinian newborn at another Israeli checkpoint, a spokeswoman for the Israeli Physicians for Human Rights said, quote, we don't know how many have died like this because many people don't even bother to set out for hospital, knowing the soldiers will stop them. These people offer no threat to Israel. It is like a routine terrorism, end of quote. The third and last of those <coughs> cases is shooting children, quote, for sport. Palestinian children have been fatally targeted in minor stone-throwing incidences by professionally trained Israeli sharpshooters, very well documented in the Israeli media. If a sharpshooter fires, as revealed in one of those sharpshooters' testimonies given to Israeli journalist 
Amir Ahas in Haaretz, he fires for certain in order to kill. Keenness to shoot, lack of restraint, being bored or even tired, were among the key excuses this soldier gave to Amir Ahas to justify his army's shoot to kill policy. And when there was no stone throwing incident to hide behind, Israeli soldiers had to provoke one. The veteran American journalist Chris Hedges exposes how Israeli troops in Gaza had systematically cursed and otherwise provoked Palestinian children playing in the dunes of Rafah, in the southern Gaza Strip, in order to shoot them. He said, the soldiers shoot with silencers. The bullets from the M16 rifles tumble end over end through the children's slight bodies. Later in the hospital, I will see the destruction. The stomachs ripped out, the gaping holes in limbs and torsos. Yesterday, he says, at this spot, the Israelis shot eight. Children have been shot in other conflicts, he says, I have covered. But I have never before watched soldiers entice children like mice into a trap and murder them for sport. End of quote. The above examples exhibit mainstream tendencies in Israel to view and treat Palestinians under Israeli control as less than humans, or what I call relative humans. Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights proclaims all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Any advocate of universal human rights who espouses the principle of moral consistency must unequivocally recognize the equality of all human beings in their human attribute and consequently in their respective life's worth. I define relative humanization as the belief and the practice based on that belief that certain human beings, to the extent that they share a common religious, ethnic, cultural, or other similarly substantial identity attribute, lack one or more of the necessary attributes of being human, and are therefore human only in the relative sense, not absolutely and not unequivocally. Accordingly, such relative humans are entitled to only a subset of the otherwise inalienable rights that are due to full humans. The hegemonic oppressors often attempt to coerce the oppressed, the relative humans, into foregoing their demand for equal humanity, for justice, and into accepting peace with reconciliation instead. Peace, in this context, invariably implies the end of resistance to injustice, not an end to the unjust order that gave birth to resistance in the first place. To the oppressed, such a call for peace devoid of justice is construed as seeking to change the consciousness of the oppressed, not the situation which oppresses them, as Simone de Beauvoir perceptively remarks. Changing perceptions and self-perceptions may lead to what I term the content slave situation, whereby the essence of a master-slave relationship is largely maintained, but the slave acquires a sense of satisfaction with her role as a slave and with her relation to her master. Any exploration of commonalities between oppressor and oppressed, while preserving the very cause of oppression, hoping that such root causes of oppression would be addressed later or would somehow be mitigated or forgotten, is equivalent to self-delusion or deceptive pacification. Even if the oppressed <clears throat> ostensibly agree to such a process, it cannot be out of volition and therefore the process cannot be considered ethical. As Israel shifts steadily to the fanatic, overtly racist right, as its latest parliamentary election results have shown, Palestinians under its control are increasingly being brutalized by its escalating colonial and apartheid policies, designed to push them out of their homeland to make a self-fulfilling prophecy of the old Zionist Canard, a land without a people for a people without a land. In parallel, international civil society, according to numerous indicators, is reaching a turning point in its view of Israel as a pariah state acting above the law of nations, and accordingly in its effective action to penalize and ostracize Israel as it did to apartheid South Africa. The Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice, and equality may well be reaching its South Africa moment. Palestinian civil society and a growing number of influential human rights advocates around the world, recognize, including in Israel, recognize that Israel's regime over the indigenous people of Palestine 
constitutes occupation, colonialism, and apartheid. Specifically, Israel's decades-old oppression takes three basic interconnected forms outlined in the boycott, <coughs> divestment, and sanctions, or BDS call, issued by the absolute majority of Palestinian civil society in July 2005. Those three basic forms of oppression are, one, the prolonged occupation and colonization since 1967 <coughs> of Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and other Arab territories, two, the legalized and institutionalized system of racial discrimination against Palestinian citizens of Israel, which meets the UN definition of apartheid. Three, the persistent denial of the UN sanctioned rights of Palestinian refugees, paramount among which is their right to reparations and to return to their homes of origin in accordance with UN Resolution 194. Ending these three forms of oppression is the minimal requirement to achieve relative justice and consequently a sustainable peace in our entire region. Perhaps the most contested aspect of the BDS call is the applicability of the crime of apartheid to Israel, often dismissed as a false analogy between quotes, given the many obvious differences between Israel and South Africa, including the fact that Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel are allowed to vote. The main problem with this assertion is that it assumes, incorrectly, that apartheid is a South African trademark, and therefore that every <coughs> regime accused of practicing apartheid must be shown to be identical to South Africa's apartheid regime of yesteryear. In fact, you had apartheid in this country, the Jim Crow South. We just did not call it that because there was no UN convention to define that term, apartheid. Apartheid, however, although brought toward attention and given its name by the racist regime in South Africa, is recognized by the United Nations as a generalized crime with a universal definition. The International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid of 1973 defines apartheid as establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them, in particular by means such as segregation, expropriation of land, and denial of the right to leave and return to their country, the right to a nationality, and the right to freedom of movement and residence. And by the way, the UN's definition of racial group is very wide. Furthermore, the 2002 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court defines the crime of apartheid as such, inhumane acts committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime." End of quote. As a 2008 in-depth strategic position paper published by the Palestinian BDS National Committee, DNC, which is the largest coalition in Palestinian civil society, <coughs> Israel's origins, laws, and policies against the Palestinian people fit to a large extent the UN definition of apartheid. The conceptual origins of Israel's unique form of apartheid are found in political Zionism, a racist European ideology that was adopted by the dominant stream of the Zionist movement, the World Zionist Organization, the Jewish Agency, Jewish National Fund, among others, in order to justify and recruit political support for its colonial project of establishing an exclusive supremacist Jewish state in historic Palestine. Israel's regime over the Palestinian people amounts to apartheid precisely because it displays many of the main features of the crime as defined by international law, most importantly, the more than 50 current Israeli laws that discriminate between Jewish and non-Jewish citizens. From land ownership to education to health to jobs to housing, the indigenous Palestinian population that are citizens in Israel have been persistently denied equality by the Israeli state's laws and policies. The fact that those Palestinians can vote, unlike black South Africans, uh, 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 becomes almost a formality, a tokenism, of sorts, clearly designed to project a deceptive image of democracy and fend off well-justified accusations of apartheid. The iconic Jewish-American writer I.F. Stone prophetically wrote back in 1967, quote, Israel is creating a kind of moral schizophrenia in world Jewry. In the outside world, the welfare of Jews depends on the maintenance of secular, non-racial, pluralistic societies. In Israel, Jewry 
finds itself defending a society in which mixed marriages cannot be legalized, in which non-Jews have a lesser status than Jews, and in which the ideal is racial and exclusionist, end of quote. I have stone. The right of the Palestinian people to enjoy equal rights is not negotiable or relative. It's the sine qua non of a just and durable peace in Palestine and the region. As Edward Said once summed up the question of Palestine in a personal conversation <coughs> with me, it's equality or nothing. Anyone who claims to support Palestinian rights under international law, <coughs> while calling only for ending the 46-year-old occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, is actually upholding most of the rights of, <coughs> of a mere 38% of the Palestinian people, those residing in the West Bank and Gaza. According to 2013 statistics, of the 11.8 million Palestinians, 50% <coughs> live in exile, denied their UN sanctioned right to return to their homes of origin, and 12% of the entire Palestinian people are Palestinian citizens of the State of Israel, who live under a system of what the US State Department calls, quote, institutional, legal, and societal <coughs> discrimination. Freedom, justice, and equality, the main slogans of the BDS movement, are not only rooted in a rich heritage of Palestinian <coughs> popular and civic resistance, they're also inspired by the enduring legacy of Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King, who creatively, persistently, and with piercing vision, coupled peace with justice, and both with the irreducible right to equality. If boycott, at the most fundamental level, constitutes withdrawing cooperation from an evil system or policy, as Martin Luther King Jr. taught us in a different context, BDS fundamentally is calling upon all people of conscience and their institutions to fulfill their profound moral obligation to desist from complicity in Israel's system of oppression against the Palestinians. Ending complicity in crime is hardly heroic. Given the billions of dollars lavished by the United States on Israel every year, US taxpayers are in effect, and irrespective of their will, subsidizing Israel's violations of international law at a time when their own social, educational, health, housing, and other services are undergoing taxing cuts. Striving to end US complicity in Israel's oppression <coughs> becomes not only good for the Palestinians, but also good for the 99% in this country who are struggling for social and economic justice and a dignified living. Building on, on its uh, global ascendance, the BDS movement has spread across many US campuses, churches, community centers, LGBTQ organizations, Jewish groups, scoring important victories and increasingly winning hearts and minds. BDS has entered the US mainstream to the extent that President Barack Obama found it necessary to attack it directly in his address to APAC, uh, APAC's annual conference on March 4, 2012, thus joining a large chorus of US politicians whose vehement vilification of BDS has put them on a moral plane with those white Americans who pushed back against the Montgomery bus boycott, and with those who long held the line against a boycott and divestment campaign targeting apartheid South Africa, uh, as was mentioned. <coughs> with its many advances in the economic, cultural, and academic boycott field, BDS, which is led by the largest coalition in Palestinian society, is viewed today by Israeli officials as, quote, a strategic threat to Israel's regime of oppression. With its continued siege of the occupied Gaza Strip, its untamed construction of illegal colonies and the wall in the West Bank, especially in and around occupied Jerusalem, its strategy of Judaization, quote unquote, as mentioned in a UN report, its adoption of a battery of racist laws, and its unbending denial of the UN stipulated right of return for Palestinian refugees, Israel has embarked on an entirely more belligerent and violent phase in its attempt to extinguish the question of Palestine through literally disappearing the Palestinians, as Edward Said would say. Israel and its well-oiled lobby groups, which Thomas Friedman accuses of buying and paying for allegiance in Congress, have been trying to delegitimize the Palestinian quest for equal rights under international law by portraying the quintessentially nonviolent BDS calls emphasis on equal rights and the right of return as aiming to, quote, destroy Israel. <coughs> if equality and justice would destroy Israel, one cannot but ask, what does that say about Israel? 
Did equality and justice destroy South Africa? Did they destroy Alabama? <coughs> of course not. Justice and equality only destroy their negation, injustice and inequality. BDS advocates equal rights for all humans and categorically opposes all forms of racism, including Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, as well as racism against blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, and others. The impressive growth of BDS in recent years has been met with panic, slander, <laughs> and, and over-the-top bullying, as witnessed most recently with the unprecedented vilification against the American Studies Association, the Modern Language Association, and other entities that have criticized Israeli policies, or, as in the ASA case, called for an academic boycott of Israeli institutions. To understand why the ASA boycott has attracted considerably more than its fair share of attacks from the Israeli establishment and Israeli lobby groups in the US and its apologists, one must examine the wider context, context the trend of BDS growth worldwide, which I, I won't blame you if you don't know about in this country because of the, your so-called media it doesn't tell you. <laughs> the BDS movement set an impressive number of precedents in 2013 which seems to be carried through to 2014. In fact, a few days ago, the giant $200 billion Dutch pension management fund, PGGM, divested from all Israeli banks because of their illegal operations in the occupied Palestinian territory. Those of you who were active in the anti-apartheid movement of South Africa will remember how long it took to divest from South African banks under apartheid, 30 years. 30 years of struggle to get to that point. We've already reached that, and not in Ireland or South Africa or India or Brazil, in the Netherlands, Israel's best or second best friend in Europe. Trade union federations with millions of members in Brazil, South Africa, Britain, Ireland, and elsewhere have endorsed BDS. Some corporations that are complicit in Israel's occupation and violations of international law, such as Veolia, Alstom, G4S, have paid a heavier than expected price in the form of continuous loss of lucrative contracts worth, in some cases, billions of dollars, as in Veolia's case. On the academic BDS front, in a letter of support to the ASA, the University of Hawaii Ethnic Studies Department became the first academic department in the United States to support the academic boycott of Israel. In April 2013, the Association for Asian American Studies endorsed the academic boycott, and it was the first professional academic association in the US to do so. Around the same time, the Teachers Union of Ireland, in its national convention, unanimously called on its members to cease all cultural and, and academic collaboration with, quote, the apartheid state of Israel. And the Federation of French-speaking Belgian students representing 100,000 members, adopted a freeze on all academic partnerships with Israeli academic institutions. Student councils at several North American universities, including the widely publicized case at UC Berkeley, adopted divestment from companies profiting from Israel's occupation. Several UC uh, campuses have, uh, student councils have adopted uh, divestment. Also in 2013, Stephen Hawking, the world's leading scientist, boycotted an Israeli conference led by Shimon Peres. It's worth mentioning that in March 2011, the University of Johannesburg in South Africa was the first in the world to sever links with an Israeli university, Ben Gurion University in this case, over the latter's collusion in human rights violations. Many world-renowned artists and music bands have in the last few years canceled scheduled performances in Israel or refused to visit Israel in the first place. It's no longer just Roger Waters, and Alice Walker, and Naomi Klein, and Judith Butler, the list is, has grown <coughs> tremendously among cultural workers and artists. Multi-million dollar campaigns by the Israeli Foreign Ministry to rebrand Israel through art, science, and the cynical use of LGBT rights to whitewash, or rather pinkwash, Israel's denial of basic rights for the Palestinians have largely failed to cover up Israel's daily injustices. To attest to that, in June of last year, 2013, the Israeli government officially shifted overall responsibility for fighting BDS from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. So the propaganda is not working, let's try the Strategic Affairs Department. We don't know what that means, by the way. <laughs> Whether or not BDS is reaching a tipping point, it is hard to deny 
that recent BDS developments have led to an explosion of interest in scrutinizing and criticizing aspects of Israel's regime of oppression. They have also provided a critically needed free space for debating Israel's denial of Palestinian rights and for connecting the struggle for Palestinian rights with struggles in the United States against war, racism, environmental destruction, right-wing immigrant policies, and economic injustice. Calling for a boycott of Israel and its complicit institutions is still quite controversial in the US and may still cause its untenured advocate an unexpected career end. But it is no longer taboo. <coughs> in conclusion, the Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, reminds us that, quote, dehumanization, which marks not only those whose humanity has been stolen, but also, though in a different way, those who have stolen it, is a distortion of the vocation of becoming more fully human. The struggle for humanization, he says, is possible only because dehumanization, although a concrete historical fact, is not a given destiny, but the result of an unjust order that engenders violence in the oppressors, which in turn dehumanizes the oppressed. In order for the struggle to have meaning, he says, the oppressed must not, in seeking to regain their humanity, become in turn oppressors of the oppressors, but rather restorers of the humanity of both." End of quote. Striving to do just that, the BDS movement has consistently rejected the notion of revenge and opted for justice instead, and the difference is enormous. It does not regard the attainment of Palestinian rights as a negation of anyone else's rights, but as a basic fulfillment of the right to have rights, and simultaneously as a magnanimous offer to the oppressors to regain their humanity by ceasing to be oppressors. A movement that dwells in citizens' consciences, that is rooted in an oppressed people's heritage of struggle for justice, that is based on equal humanity by <coughs> relative humanity, and that's inspired by the rich and diverse legacies of Mandela and King, cannot be defeated or co-opted. Our South Africa moment has arrived. Thank you.